Um, good morning. It's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you for being here, and thank you for letting me be with you today. Um, my name is Meredith Clayson. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Philip Micklin, Emeritus Professor in the Department of Geography at Western Michigan University. Dr. Micklin has focused on water management issues in the former Soviet Union for more than 40 years, his major interest in Central Asia for the past quarter century. Dr. Micklin is particularly interested in the human-induced desiccation of the Aral Sea and its environmental and human consequences, as well as the related problems of water sharing and water management in and among the newly independent states of Central Asia. Dr. Micklin has visited and lived in the former Soviet Union and Central Asia many times, conducting research, participating in conferences, and working for the United Nations and the U.S. government. He has collaborated with Dr. Nikolai Aladin of the Zoological Institute of the Russian Academy of Science since 1989 on Aral Sea research, including a month-long expedition in 2005 funded by the National Geographic Society and a follow-up visit in 2007. Dr. Micklin has numerous publications as author and editor of several books and has published more than 70 articles and book chapters. Please join me in welcoming him today to speak to you on the desiccation of the Aral Sea a water management disaster of the Soviet Union. What I'm going to talk about today is the Aral Sea. And what you see in front of you on the screen here is a very recent satellite image of the Aral Sea. If you look in the upper right corner, you can see this was uh, imaged on June 25, 2010. And it shows, as you can see, the different water bodies that now constitute the Aral Sea. In 1960, as you'll see, as I go through my talk, all of these wa separate water bodies you see here were one large lake. <clears throat> Structure of my presentation. I was a university professor for more than 30 years, so you know, you have an ingrained way of doing presentations. So I hope this is reasonably organized. And I want you to know if I tend to try to present a lot of information, sometimes people tell me too much. But all of the material that you will see here will be available on the Institute's website. Uh, they said in PDF format, and your uh, you can certainly load, download it and use it in your classes in any way you want. Okay, so you will get, if you miss a point here and say, my golly, go back or something, you will have access to it. Uh, first talk about the location, history, and character of the Aral Sea. Modern desiccation of the Aral Sea. When I say modern, post-1960, that's when this huge desiccation or drying of the Aral Sea has occurred. Ecological, economic, and health consequences of the Aral Sea drying or desiccation. Future, obviously that's important, of the Aral Sea and its uh, immediately adjacent environment. Lessons of the Aral Sea. Is there anything worthwhile for other environmental problems in other parts of the world that we can perhaps draw lessons from what has happened to the Aral Sea. And then finally, if there is time, I certainly want to leave time for questions because I know that's obviously one of the most important things in an institute like this is a chance for the audience to ask the presenter questions, which he may not have covered in his presentation or which he, they may have some particular questions about. So I have some photos just around the Aral Sea, and I'll watch the time fairly carefully. And perhaps actually during the question and answer uh, sequence, if I'm not able to show them during the regular presentation, I'll just kind of punch them through. I'm a geographer, and geographers always want to know where things are. So here's a map of, as you can see, Eurasia. And right here is Central Asia. And that's where the Aral Sea is located, right there. 
and the, num the countries that are in the so-called Aral Sea Basin, the drainage basin of the Aral Sea, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan, and also little pieces of Iran and Afghanistan. Although simply because of the political geography of this region, fundamentally I'll be focusing on the parts of the Aral Sea Basin within the, former, uh, the five former republics of the Soviet Union, which I'm sure as you all know, the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991. And all of the republics, the 15 republics that constituted the Soviet Union became independent countries. All of them are in the UN. Uh, a close-up of the Aral Sea Basin, you can see it right here. I know you're talking about fresh water and rivers, or you have heard presentations about it. Two key rivers here. The Sir Darya River right here, and the Amu Darya River right here. And actually, Darya in the Turkic languages means river. So really, when you're saying Amu Darya River, you're saying Amu River River. But whatever, that's the convention, and you may hear me referring both ways today. Uh, the red arrow, this is the Amu right here. There's a picture, Amu Darya near Urgench, Uzbekistan in 2003. You can see that even though this river has lost a lot of water because of irrigation withdrawals, it's still a very major uh, river. Going back to the map, here's the Sirdarya River here. It comes into the north. The Amu comes in from the south. The, the Sir, back before the uh, rivers lost so much water after 1960, the Sir had a flow uh, about one half of the Amu Darya. A smaller river, but still quite large. Here's a picture that I took in 2005. Uh, in the lower reaches of the Sir Darya. The Errol's past. Uh, history doesn't predetermine the future, but oftentimes it is important to understand what's happened in the past to get some idea of what might happen in the future. And the same thing is true of the Errol Sea. Uh, Actually, the Aral Sea, it's a lake. Why did they call it a sea, or why did they call it a sea? Because it was very large, and it also was, uh, and was what is called a brackish water lake, meaning it was not fresh water. It had about one-third, on average, of the salinity of the ocean, but it has freshwater fish species. Okay, the most recent expression of the lake appeared at the end of the Pleistocene, which they date about 10 to 15,000 years ago. And at times, the Amu Darya, the largest river, flowed into the Aral Sea. At other times, it turned its course from the north to the west, and it flowed into the Caspian Sea. And you need to understand this to understand why in the past there have been lots of level fluctuations of the Aral Sea. Had to do uh, to those times when the Amu Darya, for natural and human reasons, was diverted westward. Diverted westward, less water, down goes the level. Diverted back, both owing to natural and sometimes human causes, the level went up. And that's what I say here. It's, repeat, it's repeatedly been desiccated in the past. The most recent desiccation is not the only one that's happened over the last 10,000 years. And again, uh, some of these diversions of the Amu Darya related to human causes. I won't go into them because I really don't have the time here. And some of them were due to natural causes. The last major death drying of the Aral occurred from the late 13th to the middle 16th century and was likely human related. And sea level during this medieval period 
fell nearly as low as it is today. There's been a lot of recent archaeological work on the bottom of the dried sea, which makes it a lot easier, and they've found settlements, all kinds of archaeological remains from medieval times. And also they can date the sediments too, pretty accurately using radiocarbon, figure out when these occurred. Now, irrigation, this is one of the ancient, Central Asia is one of the ancient regions of irrigation. And it's been practiced here for several thousand years. And interestingly, it appears irrigation until the last 50 years did not have a major influence on the declines in levels. There's some reasons for that. I don't have time for them here. In the articles that I provided leading up to this conference, some of the things I've published, you, you can read some of that. But in any case, it is only irrigation over about the last 50 years that really affected the Aral Sea level. Um, that's not terribly important. A key point, the Aral is resilient, and it has come back from major recessions several times in the past. So what's the lesson here? I'll go through these later, but there's hope for the Aral, even though, as you'll see, it's really dried up over the last 50 years. It's come back both in its physical form and biologically in the past. And this is just showing some archaeological sites and the old bed of the Sirdarya River, the one that comes in from the north. The fellow here, Dr. Aladdin that I work with, in fact, he is going to be visiting me in the next few days, from the Zoological Institute in St. Petersburg, certainly the premier researcher on the Aral Sea among the scientists in the former Soviet Union. And I'll show you, here's a close-up ceramics that came from a mausoleum, a tomb, that came out from under 18 meters of water in the early part of the present century. Okay. Uh, soxa wool, black soxa wool, a shrub, and we found this stump. It was a fossilized stump, and we found it at a on the bottom of the Aral Sea, and it was under, what do I say here? Yes, under 20 meters of water. Well, what does all this show? So is that the level in the past, in the historical past, was very low. It's not just today. Okay, and again, I talked about the diversion of the Amudarya River westward as probably the major cause of the drops in levels in the historical past and also when the river returned for the rise of level again. And what you see here, the Aral Sea, Sirdarya, Amudarya, and where this old course, this alternate uh, route of the Amudarya was, it went from the lower reaches across the, what's called the Karakum Desert, the Black Desert, and into the Caspian Sea. Lots of evidence, uh, archaeological and, and uh, geomorphological for this. Okay, here we go. The Aral Sea, prior to the 1960s, what we call an endoric or terminal lake. And the key thing to understand here is that the lake has inflow, two rivers, Amudarya, Sirdarya, but no outflow. So it's different than the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes have drainage and uh, water coming into them, but then they, what, the water flows from one great lake to the other and ultimately the Atlantic Ocean. In the case of the Aral Sea, no outflow. Okay, so the balance, the level is determined by the balance between river inflow and what we call uh, surface, or sur actually net surface evaporation, evaporation from the surface minus precipitation on it. For the period 1800 to 1960, the Aral had a relatively stable level, and it had a salinity about 10 grams per liter, a little less than one-third of the ocean. 20 fish species were endemic, or considered endemic to the Aral. 
Most of them are of freshwater origin. What they would do, spend part of their times in the Aral Sea and the rest in the, fresh the freshwater rivers that ran into it. A number of the species had com uh, considerable commercial significance. I list some of them here. Uh, I won't go through the individual species. They introduced, an interesting thing is that the Aral Sea, prior to its modern desiccation, had uh, received, I don't know if you'd call them insults, but a number of interferences from human beings. People who just kind of say, hey, here's a fish species, I wonder if it could survive in the Aral Sea. Haul it there, throw it in. Most didn't, but some did. A number of the introduced species survive, oftentimes to the detriment of indigenous species, both invertebrates, the food supply, and the fish that fed on the invertebrates. A picture, not mine, a person that I've worked with from uh, Moscow, the Institute of Water Problems in Moscow. Sudok, a Russian name, Pike Perch. Um, she, uh, this picture was taken by her in 1978. And the fish disappeared. The Sudok disappeared from the Aral in the early 80s because of rising salinity. A large fish, extremely tasty fish. It's now back in part of the Aral Sea in large numbers, and I'll say something about that later. Modern desiccation, drying of the sea. Began in the early 1960s and continues unabated. Okay. There, we could have expected uh, if there had not been major human interference over the last 50 years, that these arrows level would have dropped somewhat because of natural cycles, but nothing like what it has. Uh, probably about 80% of the drop in the sea's level, decrease in volume, decrease in area, whichever way you want to look at it, can be attributed to human influences over the last uh, 50 years. So this is one of these very clear cases of human-induced environmental degradation, without a question. Now, climate change. Everybody's interested in climate change, and I'm certainly a believer in climate change. I'm not a denier. It has been put forward by some as a significant contributor to the arrows drying. My own view, and a number of other people that have done a lot of research on the arrow is until recently, climate change did not play a major role in the drying of the arrow. But, as I say the last line there, it will be much more important factor affecting arrow levels in the future, and we need to, you know, take a very careful look at it. Okay, what did happen? What caused the desiccation of the Aral Sea? Pretty much one particular human action, expansion of irrigation. Remember I said irrigation has been practiced here for thousands of years. But the character and nature of irrigation changed, beginning in the 50s, continuing into the 1980s, uh, continuing today. And what they did is they expanded, simply stated, they expanded irrigation beyond the point of sustainability. The environment up to a certain point in terms of the area irrigated and the manner of irrigation could stand water being taken out to it because there were what called compensating factors. But all of a sudden those compensating factors were exhausted and then the level began to go very rapidly. Although I have to say the Soviet water management planners in the 1950s and 60s knew, they knew that probably very likely, huge expansion of irrigation would dry the Aral Sea. But they didn't see the rapidity of it, and they didn't, in, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, realize how broad and serious the consequences would be. And that's what I say here. They underestimated the consequences. But on the other hand, uh, irrigation did bring a lot of benefits to Central Asia. So you really, uh, 
I, I don't think what they did was the right thing to do, but there were benefits from it. It wasn't like it was all totally bad. Changing profile of the Aral Sea, and you can, I think, get an idea of what's happened to the sea. 1960, 71, 76, 89, 2000, uh, early September. 2025, obviously, the future is inherently unknowable. But if present trends continue, this is probably what's going to be left of the Aral Sea in 2025. And this, I won't go through the details of this, it simply shows river flow for into the Aral Sea estimated for different periods. And what you can see is down, 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 really low in the 80s, back up in the 90s, down. This was a drought time in Central Asia, the mountains where the water comes from. Back up again, and the last uh, four years have been another drought period. Although looking at satellite imagery this spring, they are getting, this is a heavy flow year, but I don't know how much uh, difference that's going to make. Aral Sea level, 1950 to 2010, down it goes. Uh, in the late 80s, the Aral Sea split into two different water bodies. Small sea in the north, large Aral in the south. The small seas level has been stabilized. And I'll talk, there's a big project that was finished uh, in 2006, really helped the small Aral Sea. I'll talk more about that later. Large Aral Sea, uh, which is in a much more dire situation, it's continued to go down ra very rapidly. Satellite images, 1964, 73, 96, I won't talk about what these particular satellites are. And here's September 6, 2009, which uh, was last fall, and uh, the Errol was in its most dried situation since 1960. It's come back a little bit this spring. My own estimate is probably this summer uh, it's going to dry to a condition very similar or even worse than this. Some statistics, I won't go through all of these, you'll get this presentation. Basically, they just reflect what you see here. Rapidly dropping level, volume, and area, and rising salinity. And of course, with rising salinity, the fish, the indigenous fish, which were freshwater species, couldn't stand the growing salinity. They couldn't adjust to it. And they disappeared, most of them disappeared uh, from the southern sea uh, by the early 80s. The northern sea is a different, uh, a different story. It's, it's always had fish, although the number of species dropped to just one or two by the late 1980s and uh, through the 90s. Okay, just all of this is just statistical stuff. I won't spend a lot of time on it. I wanted to show you, this is the sea on August 18th, 2008, but uh, this isn't my work, but someone uh, superimposed the original outline of the Aral Sea. And you can get an idea how much it's dried up. About, let's see, by 2010, areas down about 88%, and the volume about 92%. Uh, again, irrigation, I guess we could call it the culprit, although certainly it contributed to the economic development of Central Asia under the Soviets. The, the big expansion of irrigation uh, began, well, it was some of it in the 1920s, but the, the, the most recent began in the 1950s and con continued at a very great pace into the 1980s. Since then, irrigation... It's slowly increasing, but the water withdrawals for irrigation appear to have stabilized or gone down a bit. Why? Crop switches primarily, taking the worst land, the worst irrigated land that should never have been irrigated out of uh, production. Uh, cotton, if you've known anything about the Aral Sea, what the common wisdom, which is true, is that cotton was the big culprit, the expansion of cotton cultivation. That was true. Rice also, they grew a lot of rice down there. Rice takes more water than cotton. They've cut back 
Uzbekistan, the leading producer in the area, has cut back somewhat on their cotton production, but cotton's still exceptionally important. I was talking with one of the other presenters from yesterday this morning and said that uh, we just were discussing the fact that cotton is so important to nations like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan because it's a main source of foreign currency earnings. A lot of irrigation there. 2009, about 8 million hectares equals about 20 million acres, about half of the total irrigated area in the United States. So this is a very major region of irrigation in the world. Uh, There's a picture of one of the irrigation canals, uh, what an offtake canal, down in Karakalpakstan, which is located uh, on the southern sh- the former southern shore of the Aral Sea. Ecological economic health consequences of the Aral Sea desiccation. Lots of things. This is the most important ones. Salt dust storms from the exposed bottom of the Aral Sea affect a really huge adjacent area. Destruction of the Aral's ecosystem and loss of an important commercial fishery. Reduction of the flow of the Amu and Sir Darya and degradation of their deltas. And their deltas, very important. They were and still are to a degree. Areas of great biological diversity and also economic importance. Very important agriculturally. Climatic change around the sea has taken place. Water bodies moderate temperatures and provide moisture and As the sea has receded, that influence has decreased. Drops in groundwater, poor quality drinking water obtained from polluted and saline rivers, irrigation canals, and shallow wells. Obviously, that is not a direct effect of the desiccation of the Aral Sea, but I put it in here simply to emphasize that not all the problems you find in around the Aral Sea owe to directly to the desiccation of the sea. Some of it's third world medical and health conditions. Uh, You can see this is, again, high morbidity, sickness, mortality, death. And very interesting, I'll talk a little bit about this. The bioweapons facility on what used to be an island, now a peninsula in the Aral Sea, that became very prominent actually internationally in the 1990s. Okay, uh, the ship's graveyard in Moinak. I was there in September 89 with the National Geographic, and we took pictures of these rather large boats. This one's probably 70 feet long, fishing boats and also cargo ships. Well, the Aral Sea dried. They couldn't get these boats to port. The fish disappeared, so they just ran them aground and left them there on the drying bottom. These have all been cut up. Under the Soviets, when the Aral Sea issue came to world attention in the late 80s, the Soviets got all nervous about it. It was, you know, directions from Moscow. And they told them, cut these ships up. We don't want people coming down taking pictures of them. There are still some old ships on the bottom that they didn't get to where they mounted to show, you know, here's what it used to look like. But these particular ones are gone. Uh, the, the, at the northern end of the Aral Sea is the port of Aralsk, and uh, I wouldn't call it a city, but a good-sized town. It was a major port and transshipment point where things move from railway to ships and ships to railway. And this shows the harbor. You can see the cranes in the background. They've got nothing to do now. They're just resting in resting hulks. But there is a project partially implemented to try to restore Aralsk as a port. And I'll say a bit more about that later. Okay, uh, primary diseases and afflictions in the disaster zone around the Aral Sea. And you can see a large number of problems listed on the left and major causal factors on the right. And lots of problems. You can see respiratory problems, hepatitis, typhus, paratyphus, tuberculosis, even, notice down here, plague. They still have plague there, carried by fleas uh, on 
these, the creatures that live on the bottom of the Aral Sea, which surprisingly certain these uh, gerbil-like animals have just flourished on the dried bottom. Lots of them around, they get these fleas on them. And, and uh, uh, occurrence of plague happens. It's not real common, but it's not rare, and people die from it down there. <clears throat> so these are a whole list of... And notice, again, some of these things are not... Well, some aren't, some aren't directly right at the RLC. Uh, maternal anemia. Poor diet and frequent pregnancies, but the poor diet actually is related to what's happened to the RLC. One thing that was good uh, in terms of diet that was good is they used to have access to lots of fish, protein. Not so much anymore. There's still fish caught in the deltas and in the rivers, but the catch is nowhere near what it was when the Aral Sea was, very bio, was biologically productive as far as fish are concerned. More ship pictures, these taken in 2005 when we had an expedition there. And uh, this is in the, on the, in the very northern part of the Aral Sea, what's now called the separated sea, small Aral Sea. And if you look, ships, cows, however it's a hot area, so they, they use them for shade now. And these ships, we measured the length, they, they were... 140 feet long, they were pretty good-sized ships. Uh, more consequences of, in this case, not directly the desiccation of the Aral Sea, but the diminished flow of the Amu Darya. This is a nature preserve, and this uh, particular forest, the Tugai Forest, which is a certain uh, uh, shrub and tree community, was dying because groundwater levels had fallen. Uh, Buhara deer at this same nature preserve, which are listed in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Red Book of Endangered Species. And what they had done, there were some in the wild, but they had captured some for breeding purposes, again, to try to make sure that they didn't go extinct. Dust salt storms. Well, we have clear evidence. Well, if you live down there, obviously, you can just go outside in a dust salt storm and you know something's happening. These huge salt dust storms arise primarily from this dried eastern part because it's extensive. Shallow part of the sea is dried, exposed to the bottom. Salt collected on it and dust gets strong winds at times of the year, and here it goes, blowing this way north to the northwest, uh, blowing from the northeast. And here, here's a really big one, a massive... Salt dust storm, uh, April 29, 2008. Stretched for more than 600 kilometers downwind. And they thought, the scientists thought that as the Aral Sea dried these, for some geochemical reasons, the, salt, the dust storms and salt storms would diminish, but they haven't. This is the largest one I think ever recorded. And it, it's a problem. You breathe this stuff, these salts, this mixture of salts, they're not good for you. They harm animals, they kill vegetation, and I've never seen this, but people living down there told us that some of this is aerosol. It gets on the power lines, it forms a big crust, and actually they will, it breaks them at times, so it's a big problem. A fishing village that is being slowly buried. Vosjersdenia Islands was a bioweapons test site super secret, started in the early 1950s. Our intelligence agencies did know about it. I mean, some of the U-2 pictures from the 1960s, one reason they flew the route, not the only one, was they went over the Aral Sea and they got some pictures of it. Uh, you can see 57 pictures from, they released these in the 1990s, our Defense Department, from a U-2 spy plane. And here it is today. It's all in ruins. It's a closed area. People aren't supposed to go there without permission, but guess what? People, the locals, get there and have, for scrap metal. They go over, they bring boats. Now it's pretty more difficult because there's very little water and haul the scrap away. Well, there's a lot of concern the scrap may be contaminated. 
picture of a boat uh, that once was used to patrol around the island, Vaz Rajdani, a very fast boat, about 100 feet long. It was grounded in, along one of the dried bottoms that we visited in 2005. Future of the Aral Sea and its environs. Okay. Here's the uh, Aral Sea as of September 6, 2009. And it's actually divided into one, two, three, four, and maybe five if you count that little piece there. And there, again, you can, on the website, you can have access to this, uh, these slides. But I calculated the areas and uh, the levels. I won't go into how I did it, but whatever I did. And then uh, we had some information on salinity and how many fish species were in different places. The key point is this aerial, this uh, small aerial, because of a project that they implemented in uh, the early part of this uh, century, has come back and is fairly biologically productive and fishery productive now. And its salinity, you can see, is reasonably low, back to about what it was in 1960, surprisingly. But these other parts are very saline and biologically no fish, bacteria, brine shrimp. You know, people used to feed to their fish. There was even a proposal and um, uh, pilot project to see if it would be worthwhile trying to collect brine shrimp eggs for commercial use. But um, the salinities, they may be high enough now. They weren't high enough to make a commercial operation viable. Okay. The modern recession, when I say modern, 1960 plus, is by 2010 the most serious in several thousand years. And will soon, if present trends continue, at least for this, these southern water bodies, will become the most uh, severe in the past 10,000 years, the modern, the modern geological history of the Aral Sea. Now, what can be done? A big question mark. Restoration of the sea to its 1960 size in the foreseeable future, extremely unlikely. Why? There isn't the water available. You could bring it back. If tomorrow some, uh, some person or some government could say, stop irrigation, the sea would begin to come back very rapidly. And probably, I calculated this, take about 30-some years, and you could refill it to the 1960 levels. Problem is, the economies here, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, lesser degree Tajikistan, and lesser degree Kazakhstan, are based on irrigation. What would you do? It's the basis of the economy. So cutting off irrigation is simply, or reducing it by some significant amount, is simply not a viable option. Par partial restoration is a viable option. Partial restoration of the small sea in the north was completed in March 2006, and so far has been quite a success. They've refilled, partially refilled the northern, the small Aral Sea much more quickly than they thought. And the fish, the endemic fish, returned very quickly to the sea. Where did they come from? Sirdarya River and the lakes in the, uh, near the Sirdarya River. They just moved back in the sea when uh, habitat conditions improved, mainly lowering the salinity. Back they come. And the fishing industry, it's nothing like it was, uh, let's say, in the 60s, but it's coming back. And they're going to do a second stage of it. Now, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But partial restoration, what can be done with the southern Aral Sea, which is now basically divided into an eastern-west basin, a deep western basin, a shallow eastern basin, which almost dried up last fall. Again, some water in it, but it's really not very much. The western basin could be preserved. How? by taking the residual flow in the lower Amadaria and 
sending it into the western basin rather than letting it go into the eastern basin. And there's talk about it, but no firm, hard plans. And obviously, you'd have to do lots of research. How much is it going to cost? What are the consequences, maybe unintended ones or unrealized ones in that thing? But it could be done. Very important to preserve what is left of the Amu Darya and Sir Darya deltas. Why? Because there is still a lot of biological diversity here. They have great ecological importance and considerable economic importance. And uh, major efforts have uh, been underway and, and are underway to restore important lakes and wetlands in both deltas. Now, very important. There's a human side, obviously, extremely important one to the Aral Sea issue. And programs to improve health and welfare of the local population are of critical importance, and they are being done. And in fact, the major emphasis so far of international donors and regional organizations has been to help improve health and welfare of the people. Uh, more emphasis on that than improving the uh, environment. Okay, this is the new dam that they completed in 2005. Some pictures of it from both sides. Fish, local fishermen. This was before, or just at the time they began to raise the small arrow. Pike perch over, you can't see but I'm pointing at a pike perch. These were fish and introduced fish, black sea flounder. Huge numbers of them in the small arrow. Since they've lowered the salinity, the conditions aren't so great for them, plus they got competition, so their numbers have decreased. But overall, the fishery has improved dramatically in the uh, small arrow. The new project, I want to separate off this gulf and raise its level, but I just found out from the fellow that I work with, Dr. Aladdin, he was talking to some local officials out there, and now... They appear to be uh, more interested in restoring the whole small arrow to a higher level than just part of it. So it was kind of interesting. And again, you can look at this. This is something, um, originally, this was a project from the 1970s developed by some Soviet water management people and scientists. And I sort of modified it to uh, modern conditions. And I won't go through all of that, but it's got all the statistics there. Okay, and I want to get through this. Complication for trying to restore, partially restore, the Western Basin. Lots of oil and gas have been found out here. A lot easier to get oil and gas out if it's, you know, you're drilling your rigs on dry land rather than in water. So that may be a complication to trying to restore uh, at least parts of the uh, Western Basin of the large Aral Sea. Wetlands, some of the uh, rehabilitated and restored ones. Just a picture of local fishing. I won't say much about this, but there were huge plans in the late Soviet era to solve all the problems of, in water of Central Asia by bringing flow from Western Siberian rivers down to Central Asia. I mean, this was a gigantic project, biggest engineering project up to that time ever contemplated. They actually started on it in uh, the mid-1980s, but when Gorbachev became leader, he said, what a waste of money. And if we take this water down there to Central Asia, we'll just waste it. So they canceled the project. It continues to be talked about. I don't think it'll ever be implemented. Conclusions, okay. Full restoration of the arable in foreseeable future, very difficult and highly unlikely, but in the distant future may be possible. Harold has come back before. Small arable sea in the north, a real success story. We need more time to evaluate how it will finally turn out, but it's so far quite successful. Preservation and restoration of western large air possible. Needs much further study costs and benefits. Uh, preservation, partial restoration of deltas underway. Very important. 
the Delta Tsar is biological refugee of her fauna and flora. That's what really saved that small Aral Sea in the north. Fish disappeared, many of them, but they survived in the deltas. They partially restored the sea. Right away, these fish came back in there. Okay. Oh, climate change, as I said, not a big influence up until uh, recent years, but something has to be looked at in the future as far as its effect on the Aral Sea. I'll go through these quickly. Lessons of the Aral Sea. It's easy to wreck the environment. I think some of these are, you know, don't take a lot of thought to realize. It's easy to wreck the environment, but very difficult and time-consuming to rehabilitate it. So obviously, you want to be careful. I think we've learned those lessons over the last 40 or 50 years. Past may not be the best guide to the future. How does this relate to the Aral Sea? They expanded irrigation there for thousands of years. They expanded it up through the 50s, no problems. All of a sudden, they pushed it beyond a certain point, a threshold point, and very dramatic effects occurred. Uh, be skeptical of quick and easy fixes. I mean, people have had all kinds of solutions for the RLC problem, but really, if there were simple and inexpensive solutions, they would have been implemented. This complex problem, not easy to solve. Listen to dissenting voices. People back in the 60s and early 70s were telling the government of the Soviet Union, be careful, this could cause problems, and they didn't listen to them. And they didn't put them in jail or anything like that, but they couldn't publish, and uh, they were excluded from commissions looking at the Aral Sea, so on and so forth. On the other hand, the natural environment is amazingly resilient, and I think the Aral Sea proves that or shows it. So do not abandon hope or efforts to rehabilitate it. Oh, preserve biological refugee. I guess I've made that point. Okay, and again, I'm not expecting you to copy this, but here's some good resources. There's lots of books and publications. A lot of them are in Russian language, or some in English. But if you want some good websites on the Aral Sea in the region, Easiest thing is just do a search, Google Aral Sea, and you'll come up with a lot. But some specific ones, Central Asian Water Information Network, run by Central Asians. Everything's in Russian, everything's in English. Excellent source if you just want some quick information about the Aral Sea. Very good. NASA satellite imagery, the satellite images I showed are free. You can download them from NASA's website. And I've got the URL there. UNEP has information. World Bank, of course, too. Okay. Now, I'm going to stop my lecturing here because it's 10 o'clock and I want to allow you time to ask questions. And I'll answer the questions and I'll slowly just go through these photos. It's about people and I don't think I need to do a lot of explanation. So if people have any questions, I'm happy to do it. You didn't talk about it, but you said there was a dam, and I'm wondering what the logic of building a dam on a shrinking sea would be, so could you address right. that? Right. Well, the problem was the level of the small Aral Sea in the north and the large Aral Sea in the south grew increasingly great, and fresh river water was coming into the small Aral Sea and just flowing southward into this large Aral Sea, which was very saline, it wasn't doing any good. So they wanted to preserve the water, save it to raise the level of the North Aral Sea. So this constriction, it used to be a strait, they built a, an earthen dike across there. Originally, it was done in the early 90s, just by locals. Sea level went up, but it wasn't engineered right. It would collapse and in the late 90s, had a catastrophic collapse, and it killed two people, wiped out the dam. The World Bank had been planning a project with the Kazakh government to build an engineeringly sound facility. So they built a 13-kilometer earthen dike, and in the middle of it, you saw the picture there, they put a concrete gated structure so they could control outflow. And they used it to raise the level of the small Aral Sea in the north, two meters, seven feet, but it's done... It's uh, been amazingly su successful 
lowering salinity and bringing back species and improving the fishery. That was the dike the I was talking about. Yeah, whatever. I just had a question. When the lakes were lowered and people started drilling for oil, who owns the, the land, the lake bottom? Is it the government? Who owns that? Y yes. Um, as far as I'm aware, all of the drilling for oil and gas has been within the uh, nation of Uzbekistan on their part of the dried bottom. And all land in Uzbekistan still belongs to the government. People can lease it. You can set up a private farm, but fundamental ownership is still there. So it's government. What, what's happened as far as the oil and gas drilling is the government is, of Uzbekistan is working in collaboration with some Chinese companies and Russian companies and that, mainly exploratory so far, but when we were there in 2005, a lot of drilling rigs all over the bottom. And I heard, that, again, that there's secrecy here, you know, too. They have hit some decent gas deposits, and I think they th either have struck some significant oil or think they will. In other words, it's, they aren't going to want to re-flood around these wells, obviously, so that may prevent not complete partial, uh, or it may, they may need to somehow protect these areas from re-flooding if they try to bring back this western part of the large, what they call the large Aral Sea. Uh, yeah, a uh, question on one of the slides you, you showed, uh, the dilemma between economics and environment, how people make money or their livelihoods off of irrigated land. And, but then the next slide or two, you talked about international agencies providing money for health care and, and medical. Right. It would appear that, the only, that it's a subsidy for economics. In other words, we'll continue our traditional ways. We can do this because the environmental problems, health-wise, are, if you like, subsidized by international agencies with medical. So right. is there any con people in this region seeing the connection between the, the two, that they're just not compatible and that maybe they should do something different economically? Yes, I mean there have been certainly there's a lot been a lot of international donor work in this area. The World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, United States Agency for International Development, governments of bilateral um, agreements, aid agreements between uh, Japan and Central Asian nations and Germany and the Swiss. And they've looked at this. The problem is kind of like a big ship. It's kind of slow to turn the economy around. I mean, they realize, I mean, it would make sense to diversify their economy, get away from so much dependence on irrigation and cotton and that. Um, there have been attempts at this, but so far, nothing huge. And let me say, I didn't mention that. I said focus on improving health and wealth, medical conditions and health conditions. There's also been a considerable influence upon uh, improving irrigation, okay, to make it more efficient so it doesn't use so much water. But you've kind of got two trends. You've got people working to try to improve uh, the irrigation system, but on the other hand, the irrigation system is falling apart. Why? Because it was developed when it was the Soviet Union, there was money coming from Moscow, there were ex experts and in the post-Soviet era, it's really deteriorated. But the, there are a lot of pilot projects pri to try to improve irrigation efficiency. Obviously, people realize that's quite important. Yeah, any? Um, sorry, so I don't, yeah. Um, who's, who's making all the money out of this now? I mean, in the, in the Soviet days, okay, it was all part of the Soviet system, the, the cotton farming, and you could see how that worked, and they were providing the cotton for the Red Army uniforms or whatever. But now, um, post that, I mean, is, it, is the whole cotton industry being run by corporations? And if so, who owns the corporations? Where's the money going for all this? Because they're selling a hell of a lot of cotton. 
Let me just talk about Uzbekistan and maybe a bit about, I know more about Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is the, was the largest producer of cotton in the Soviet Union. I think it's fourth in the world now, second in exports. The, to make things simple, the control of cotton in Uzbekistan is still under the government. People, there are, quote, private farmers. They don't own the land, but they can lease it, and supposedly they're free to grow what they want. But what does the government say? It tells the local hakim of a district, the mayor or the governing officer, says, hey, yeah, you're free to grow what you want, but we're expecting so much cotton from your region. So what is a hakim? This guy has lots of power. He goes down and tells these farmers, hey, yeah, you want to grow vegetables? Okay, but you've got to go grow so much cotton. And at least up until now, the government controls the international sale of cotton. So people um, will sneak cotton out of Uzbekistan and sell it on their own, but the government really controls the cotton trade. So the system has changed, but still very much like the Soviet system. Quotas. And the government owns the cotton, and it sells it, and you ask where the money goes. The money, most of the money goes to the government because they decide, the, they're the, it's a monopsony. There's one buyer of it, so they can pretty much set the, set the price. And I'm not a, a thorough expert in what's happening with agriculture in Uzbekistan, but pretty much the farmers are still pretty impoverished. It's a real problem for them. And that, just like the Soviets, the Soviet Union was built in the backs of the workers, Uzbekistan's economy was built in the back of the peasants. It's better, but it's still huge problems. And all the Western donors are telling them, privatize land, allow people to own it. But they don't want to do that. If they do that, they're going to lose control. And allow companies to come in and buy directly cotton from cooperatives. They still have cooperatives there. It's what the state, the state farms were dissolved in the early 90s, and the collective farms turned into these things called shirkats, these cooperatives. But let them buy them directly from that. But that would mean the government wouldn't get as much money as they have. That's Uzbekistan. Now, I believe in Tajikistan, more liberalized system for cotton. And Kazakhstan doesn't produce much cotton, but they're much more liberalized. Turkmenistan is very, still very tightly government controlled, and the government controls the land, just like in Uzbekistan, owns it, basic ownership. They lease it, and you can get a 99-year lease or a 50-year lease, but you don't own it. Kyrgyzstan, people can, I believe I'm correct in saying this, and buy and sell land. These systems, are, but none of them is true what we have in the United States. We have a deed to this land, and you can just sell it. There's conditions and things on it. Uh, so I'm, I'm mostly thinking of uh, what, what arguments can be made by students uh, to take a position on uh, issues relevant to the sea. And one, of, one question that I had that I could pose was, should the canal be built to divert the residual water from that river, I forgot how you pronounce it, to the West Basin? Um, can, can you think of other sort of uh, dis, um, uh, discussion questions that, you know, are being debated by um, people in the area right now that we can, you know, bring to the classroom? Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, that to all the pros and cons of, of uh, taking the fl flow of the Amudari and its lower reaches and sending it to the west to this water body that possibly could be saved. I think mainly you've got to take a broad view. Sometimes these projects look so good till you look in, into them. What are, what are the negative consequences? What are the unintended consequences? Uh, another question might be, if, if it's not directly on the RLC, but what are the benefits and costs of privatization of land in Uzbekistan? That's been a huge one, debate over that. And uh, I would say, is what happened to the Aral Sea something unique to a state-directed economy and a state-directed 
uh, society where decisions came down from the top, or is it more general? I mean, could the very same thing happen in a capitalist society? I think that's an interesting one. Oh, oh, somebody, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just trying to go back to the previous question about the d difference of level between uh, small LLC and large LLC. Uh, how yeah. much? How much is the difference between the two? The level? Yeah. Okay. Well, I can in meters. The the small LLC they're maintaining right around 42 meters above sea level. Uh -huh. And by the fall of 2009, the large LLC, two pieces, but they're about the same level, were 26.5 meters. So you're talking. Uh, what, 12 and 4, 16 meters difference. So 48, probably 52 feet difference between them now in level. So the purpose of this dam being proposed is to operate at both levels so that, you know, there, there will be crossing it. Uh... Well, the dam that exists now, that's maintaining the level at 42 meters above sea level. Yeah. Now... What they proposed, the project until relatively recently, was to only raise further a piece of the small aerial sea. But I, this f a fellow I work with has been talking with some officials out there, and now there's a big push to raise the whole northern aerial sea, this whole separated, uh, another about another five meters, rather than just raise part of it. And, my calculations, there's enough water to do it. So I think that's a smart, I hope they do do that rather than just do this little piece. Because this little piece was going to be quite expensive, $200 million. You uh, can do the whole sea for that. I'm trying to understand also the Sirdaria yeah. and uh, Amudaria. Mm -hmm. They come at different levels, one into one region and the other into other region or something like that. I'm not sure what the level of the Amudaria is. It's at sea level, there's a, there's a difference in level. But they're far apart. One's in the north, and one comes in from the south. Yeah. My question is about the source of the two rivers. Yes. Is the source of the rivers the glaciers in the Himalayan mountains? It is. And if so, okay, then um, global warming, the increase of glacial recession will raise the level of the rivers? And I'm one, I uh, believe, no, it won't. No, it's an excellent question. Okay, so then... The, the Armudaria comes from the Palmyr Mountains, and the Palmyrs are simply an extension of the Himalayas. Palmyr is the second highest mountain range in the world. Huge glaciers up there. Sirdaria comes from the Tin Shan, a mountain range to the north. And uh, under the Soviets, they studied the glaciers a lot. They knew a lot about them. And they are receding, as are most other, as you probably realize, glaciers in the world. And I think, obviously, you'd say, okay, the glaciers are melting. That should increase the flow. It may be. We may take a while to realize it. But ultimately, that's not sustainable. What happens with... I heard a talk by... A, glaciologist who was really interesting. He said up to a certain point as glaciers shrink for, because of warming you get more r runoff. At a certain point as their area and volume decreases begins to decrease. So how long, what we would expect initially is an, that the melting of the glaciers would somewhat increase flow. But it's not, it can't, it's not long term. I mean in a, peer, in a, a number of decades depending on the melt rate, it would begin to diminish. So that's not a, that's not going to be sustainable over, but they are melting. They, they, yeah, 20%, 30% in general diminishment of the volume of the glaciers in the Pamirs and the Tin Shans. Yeah, it's a big problem like it is other parts of the world. Um, I just wanted to ask could any lessons learned that you might apply to uh, the Salton Sea or Lake Chad, as you mentioned well, in your article. Well, good question. Yeah, Salton Sea is a terminal lake in the United States. It was formed by human actions. The lake was formed in 1905. And in fact, uh, there's interest from Central Asians in the Salton Sea 
And the Salton Sea people in the Aral Sea, and I went to a Salton Sea conference in 2003 and talked about the Aral Sea and out in uh, San Diego. There's interest. Yeah, there's lessons. I mean, you, you, uh, you may know that there is a really hugely expensive restoration project underway for the Salton Sea. I think it's a billion bucks to divide it into two pieces and try to freshen one part and leave the other part as uh, uh, very salinized. And in fact, that's actually a strategy for the large Aral Sea in the south. Save the western basin, allow saline water to flow into the eastern part and use it as a, just a residual evaporator. But anyway, that would lower the salinity, and that's what they're going to do with the Salton Sea. So there are Lake Chad is another terminal lake, and uh, it's like the Aral Sea out in the desert. It's not as large. Um, its shrinkage has been more natural factors, although I believe irrigation on whatever river runs into it has been been a problem. So yeah, there's similarities, and you know, people in looking at the more general issue of lakes, saline lakes, or partially ones. Yeah, there's similarities between Salton Sea, Lake Chad. Australia has a lot of uh, salt lakes too. It's much smaller. The Aral Sea is certainly the biggest. Uh, Although it was brackish, it wasn't silly. Now it's quite a large saline lake. And most important, and certainly what happened to the Aral Sea, in my view, is the most dramatic uh, sort of demonstration of how human beings in a relatively short period can really have a huge effect on a, on a large water body. We have time for maybe one more question. Does anybody else besides Fred have a question? Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to ask about salt. Um, I mean, salt is accumulating in a lot of these irrigated fields. Sure. Um, is poisoning those fields and is reducing their, uh, their productivity. So if I've got it right, in many areas... Um, they're having to put more and more they have to, you know, the same amount of water is being taken to irrigate the fields but they're getting fewer and fewer crops all the time um, so I wonder, I mean you said maybe they don't have an alternative in the short term to growing cotton for their economy but would you like to comment on the idea that this whole cotton system is kind of doomed eventually because it's just poisoning itself I think that's a good point well, they've had They've done lots of studies on the level of salinization in Central Asia, and right, salinized lands are a huge problem. You put water onto a field, and it's relatively fresh, but has a certain amount of salts, the water evaporates, the salt stays. Now, irrigation technology for a long time has said to have drainage, but during the rapid expansion in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, because of so much pressure from central authorities in Moscow and local authorities, they just build irrigation facilities and no drainage. And so you have a huge problem of salinization of soils. And the figures are, I think, well, they divide into severely salinized, moderately, and weakly salinized. And then severely and moderately is huge. And then what you said is absolutely true. What they do is before they even plant the crops in the spring, they leach it, what they call washing the soils to get the salt out. So that increases, just as you said, that increases the water use considerably. And I, I think you may be right. Over the longer term, cotton production may be doomed. They have switched. Uzbekistan, the biggest irrigating nation there, has taken significant areas out of production of cotton and put some of them into production of irrigated winter wheat to improve the food base. So they've cut back. Turkmenistan hasn't. Turkmenistan's continuing to expand cotton production. But you, you may be right that in the longer term it's doomed anyway. Uh, yeah, right now, for Uzbekistan, to lesser degree for Turkmenistan, Irrigated agriculture, and particularly cotton production, is extremely important. What the, one thing the Kazakhs did is they've cut back on rice production. Rice really takes the water, about three times as much as. And 
that's one reason why the flow of the Sirdarya River, which, well, whatever, it comes through a number of countries, starts in Kyrgyzstan, goes through Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and in Kazakhstan. But they have cut back on rice production, and that's probably one of the reasons why the flow of the Sirdarya into the Aral Sea has been up since the, the late 1980s. I think that brings us to the end of this talk. Could everyone please join me in thanking oh. Professor Mickler? You're welcome.